Tonight, we gather in remembrance and celebration of an artist, musician, mentor, colleague, conductor, teacher, composer, and friend, Leo Cornelius Nestor. Leo was a man of word, speech, and text, and ultimately that art of the most heightened form of word and speech, which is choral and vocal music. Unlike St. Augustine, he was in no way ashamed or reticent of the text of sweet melodies which could so move the human heart. Utterance among the three divine persons in whose image we are crafted brings forth word from all of us, and our friend Leo possessed a deep capacity and fluency with word that could startle, ignite, inspire, and felicitate, all at a breakneck speed. Loquacious, perhaps, but only in the very best sense. His life of words received its first significant enhancement at St. Augustine's in Los Angeles, where the daughters of Mary and Joseph, a progressive order of sisters from Belgium, were his first mentors in language. Who can forget the stories about Sister Sheila? And from St. Augustine's, he matriculated to the seminary at Mission Santa Barbara, where under the profound influence of a saintly master of elocution, Francis of Assisi, Leo was immersed in a world of text, Latin and classics, Spanish, great literature, poetry, chant, choral music, and much more. He always spoke glowingly of his education under the friars. Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator and philosopher, once wrote that reading is not walking on the words. It is grasping the soul of them. The Franciscan fathers and brothers certainly imbued Leo with this love of reading and recitation of word and text. So his passion became the conveyance of text, primarily through the great art of choral music, in both performance at worship and in concert, and in the new compositional settings of texts ancient and new. While De Dr. Nestor never preached to a flock of birds or chastened a badly behaving wolf, as did Brother Francis, he could spellbind and excite a choir to a level of excellence that brought joy and wonder for performer and listener alike. His compositional settings which you are hearing tonight include texts of George Herbert, John Henry Newman, the Apostle Paul, the Hebrew Psalms, Ephraim the Syrian, the venerable texts of the Roman Gradual and Missal, early American hymn writers, and many more. Leo got mileage out of words. Many years ago, I was in Dublin, Ireland, when an elderly woman came alongside me on a street corner and asked, Laddie, would you help me with my bags? I responded, well, sure, ma'am. And she said, well, you're not Irish at all. And I said, no, my great-grandparents came from the south of Ireland. She wryly went on to say, well, sure, and you have the map of Ireland all over your face. I should never have told Leo that story. <laughs> they know. Leo was a very honest and transparent man. Sometimes this could get him into trouble, where the witty quickness to assess or respond got ahead of the governor of the tongue. But as words mattered deeply to him, he would use them most generously to kindly support, raise up, and welcome others. Many of you have experienced the engaging conversations, discussions, and sometimes slightly silly banter that made time with Leo so very enjoyable. Some years ago, I was facing some personal and professional difficulties, as happens in life, that Hibernian haze that the poet Yeats characterized so well as he had an abiding sense of tragedy, which sustained him through temporary periods of joy. Leo and I were ardent email correspondents, and my silence concerned him. After several pokes, 
Finally, I wrote to him with what was sort of a poor man's Heiligenstadt testament about the test situation. What I received in response was simply beautiful. A long letter with words, words of empathy, words of encouragement, and words of devoted friendship, words that I still reread today. And I know that many of you have been the, receptor, the receivers of words of this kind as well. So tonight, we honor this utterance of God, son of Cornelius and Esther from Culver City, who would have thought? Brother to Patty and Connie, close companion to Bert, Godfrey, Bill, Colleen, Jay, Gail, Bob, Richard, Jim, Alice, Kevin, and John. Mentor and inspiration to countless musicians and students. His words, musical and otherwise, have deeply impacted us all. And we commend our dear friend Leo to his rest, all too soon, but with deep admiration and with gratitude and with love. The sacrifices that the Madeline Choir School um, made in being a part of this evening are enormous. Um, and it was one of his favorite places in Earth. He really, really loved and admired what went on there. From its beginnings, from when Monsignor Mannion and Greg built this place before I think all of you were born. Um, from the time he went out there initially, um, uh, there was a thing that hung in his study which was one of his favorites and he composed nearly everything you're hearing tonight with this in a place of prominence. It is a poster from the very first arts festival, the Madeline, and I, I want the Madeline to have it back. soft rains. Leo gave me this manuscript and he said, darling, I want you to learn this and record it for me. So I looked at it and it said mezzo-soprano. <laughs> and I said, oh Leo, this is for mezzo-soprano. So he took it back, took a red pen and crossed out mezzo. <laughs> and he said, now it isn't, darling. <laughs> Leo always had a plan B. So I give you tonight my best mezzo-soprano. I mean soprano.
You know, I have never felt uh, in a concert more like uh, this is a great banquet of musical genius and going directly to heaven. I, I, I have never had this sensation myself. I read today that this concert was going to be streamed tonight, and I think it was probably streamed to heaven uh, also. And dear Leo up, up there dropped by uh, St. Ce Cecilia's office, just like, uh, you, you know, uh, I was saying before, uh, and, and said, you gotta come to a concert tonight. And uh, it's, I'm doing, uh, it's a concert of my music here at a church in Washington, and I know they're up there just enjoying it all immensely. What a great tribute to a great musical artist and a great servant of the church and church music. Uh, Leo and I go way back. Uh, Leo succeeded me at the Shrine in 1983 and uh, as the music director. And uh, it, it was an interesting journey to, to that place. We heard earlier about uh, his, his work on the West Coast, but uh, I had been uh, at St. Matthew's Cathedral here in Washington as the music director starting in, let's see, 1977, no, 74, and was there three years, and then a, a very enlightened and cultural archbishop named William Cardinal Baum was uh, sent to Washington to be our archbishop, and he loved great music and asked for me to perform Mozart masses with orchestra as part of the liturgy and the Haydn masses and all sorts of things. And so I did uh, so, so many great things, had a great choir, everything was going super. I did a uh, concert of the Monteverdi 1610 Vespers uh, over at the shrine, uh, right before I went to the shrine, and the place was sold out on the coldest day of the year uh, in February. Now, uh, what I'm saying is, this is all wonderful. Great music belongs in the church. And Leo brought great music to the church. And I think I brought a, a little great music to the church too. But it is not easy, and it has not been an easy journey for Leo and for us. You would think with someone as a genius as Leo Nestor would have no difficulties whatsoever with his work being accepted. That's not necessarily true, especially when working at very large churches. Uh, I don't know what it is about very, very large churches that aren't parishes, but sometimes the clergy sent to work there weren't very effective in the parish, let's just put it that way. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, that certainly was the case at the shrine. So you, you fight, you kill yourself to do a good job, and then it was too long, or it was too short, or it was too this, or it was too that, or you're making, I was always accused of turning the mass into a concert. I'm not doing turning it into a concert, I'm just preserving the uh, great tradition of uh, the 2000 year tradition of Catholic church music, which the Constitution on the Liturgy told Leo and told me, that's what you're supposed to do. Latin is still the official language of the church. You are supposed to preserve all the great musical creations uh, through 2,000 years of history. That is our role as church musicians. And Leo worked that role very, very well. And he was uh, at the shrine, I think, something like 17 or 18 years. I was there six, and then I went into the university teaching, and it was, it was, that was a great joy. Uh, and then, of course, when Leo left the shrine, he went right next door, right on campus, to Catholic University, and they were so fortunate to have him as the director of choirs. I don't, I'm not sure he taught composition, but he was a great, great uh, jewel to, uh, to this community, to the university, of which I'm a graduate, of which my wife is a graduate. We go, we, we, it's a real family here. Uh, tonight. Kevin has his PhD uh, uh, and his dissertation was on a great musical servant of the church, a man named Russell Woolen, who also taught back in uh, Catholic University in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. So I'm dating myself a little bit, I think. Uh, but yes, I'm 76 and I've been working in this town 
for 54 straight years. And, uh, and I've loved every minute of it, but me too, I too, like Leo, you know, had our ups and downs working in church music in this uh, a city. And I think it's a common across the country. Uh, Kevin O'Brien, I can't say enough for, he's preserving this great musical tradition, not only of Leo's music, but of all great church music here uh, in St. Peter's, this beautiful church on the hill. I was telling him in an email that I uh, conducted my very first piece of choral music downstairs in the basement, which has lovely acoustics, incidentally. <laughs> Doesn't look like much, but well, that was in 1963 when I was a senior in a high school and I was 17 years old. So, uh, but I, it is, I always remember that as we remember our youngest experiences. And this choir is so marvelous, made up of all these young people. It's so important to invest in them and expose them and allow them to perform this great music at an early age. You will remember this long, much longer than other things that will happen later in your life. It's, it's, it's amazing like that, just like I remember downstairs conducting a little piece of William Byrd named, I have longed for thy saving health, O Lord. I still remember it vividly. And I can't remember, you know, whether I brushed my teeth this morning uh, uh, now, but I sure can remember that I conducted that in the spring of 1963 before graduating from high school. So it's been a joy to be here. I look for the, forward to the rest of the concert. I uh, congratulate Kevin O'Brien for putting together such a marvelous program. All my friends in the brass and the strings and, uh, you know, Sharon, just beautiful singing. Uh, certainly, it, ever, it doesn't sound like a mezzo piece to me, uh, but, but uh, I, I, you, you just absolutely work exquisite. Everything is great. So I won't talk anymore. Thank you for letting me share about my experiences with my dear brother in church music, Leo Nestor.
There's a law in Washington, D.C. that uh, when you earn the praise of Bob Schaefer, you're on the right path, <laughs> and you have entered into the secret, you've tapped into that secret law of creativity. Congratulations, Kevin. on behalf of Leo, of course. I came to Washington in August of 2002. It was a hot August. Ran into Leo my second day, and I asked him, I said, tell me something about the Christmas concert that you do over at the Shrine. And he said, well, if you run over there right now, you'll hear the end of last Christmas concert. <laughs> it's the This was to be the time for Elaine Walter, Dean Emerita of the School of Music, to offer her eulogy on behalf of Leo. I'm happy to say that Elaine is recuperating wonderfully, and I'm sure that she wishes she were here tonight. So she gave the eulogy over to the current Dean, uh, Jacqueline Leary Warsaw, uh, who was going to read this and something happened to Jackie's schedule, and she gave it over to me to read, and I can't stay, so I wonder if somebody else <laughs> will. <clears throat> so this is Elaine's eulogy now, so when I say I, you know that I'm speaking for her. Way back in the early 80s, I was asked to chair the national search for a new music director at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. With my search team members, Dr. Gerald Muller, Richard Pru, both deceased now, we, we brought the finalists that we had selected for an all-day series of meetings and demonstrations. We put them through a tough day meeting with us, the Shrine Rector, the Archbishop, a rehearsal with the Shrine Choir, and a demonstration of their organ playing. At the end of the day, we, the committee, had our first choice. Clearly, it was a young Leo Nestor from Los Angeles. Enthusiastically agreed to by the others who interviewed and worked with him on that day, Leo began his assignment at the Shrine in 1984. Leo and I formed a working relationship that quickly evolved into a friendship as well. Several times I invited him to guest conduct a portion of the music school's annual orchestra choral concert in the concert hall at the Kennedy Center, and twice I invited him to come with us on our all-expenses-paid trips to Vatican City and Rome, where we performed for Pope John Paul II and guests inside the Pope's private reception room, the magnificent Sala Clementia, and in public concerts in the city of Rome. Both times, Leo not only conducted our singers, he also assisted with the liturgies as conductor and organist, planned for CUA's board of trustees who were meeting at the same time in Rome. When the music school was invited to move its annual Christmas concert from the Shrine Crypt Church to the upper church, joining with the Shrine's choir and Christmas concert for charity event, I and our conductors depended on Leo for advice on how to work the upper church acoustically. Leo was a master at selecting the right repertoire to fill that space and for training the excellent Shrine Choir to deliver that music. The Shrine always arranged for EWTN to record those first Friday and December concerts for later broadcast. Immediately following those concerts, Leo and I would adjourn to the sound truck parked outside the Shrine and with the engineers select the best parts of those concerts to fit into the broadcast time slot provided by EWTN. We had great fun making those decision selections, often leaving the truck by 2 a.m. with our jobs well done. 
Leo remained at the shrine, then classified as a basilica, until 2001. His work there was superb, but he wasn't always happy or satisfied there. Conflicts arose periodically between Leo and the rector, who did not always understand that a church musician's work did not, could not fit into the usual employee's nine to five workday. Leo would become frustrated and call me to sort things out, while my assistant, Judy Lindsay, would come into my office and hand me a slip of paper on which she had written, the rector is holding on the other line for you. <laughs> I did my best to calm Leo down and then to explain to the rector how a church musician works from early morning until late at night and, of course, on weekends constantly researching, planning, composing, rehearsing, and conducting the music for those liturgies. During what became Leo's last few years at the Basilica, he confided in me that he was ready for a change. He desired a university teaching position, and when our Ted Marie announced his retirement as the Justine Bayard Ward Professor of Liturgical Music, I formed a faculty committee charged with undertaking a national search for Ted's replacement and promptly called Leo to notify him of this opening. Subsequently, he submitted his credentials and the search committee named Leo as their number two finalist. When the first choice declined the offer, I was able to offer Leo the position. I told him he was the second choice because I had heard him at times berate or chide others who did not come up to his highest standards. I wanted him to know he could not do that with students. Correct them, yes, but with kindness. Leo was my last full-time appointment and how soon he learned to bring our students up to his high standards with kindness. Quickly, Leo became one of their favorite and most loved teachers. That was so evident when, after Leo died unexpectedly in 2019, just three years after his retirement, his funeral mass was filled with former students who had traveled from distances to sing at his mass or to attend the service. And on the anniversary of his death, each year on Facebook, so many alumni write glowingly of his work and the impact he had on their lives and music making. Those high musical standards he imposed on others, he likewise imposed on himself. Nothing he composed or rehearsed or conducted was ever just good enough. It had to be perfect. When Leo retired from the university, he moved to a Delaware Beach community where he built a lovely home, then just 30 minutes away from my beach house outside of Ocean City, Maryland. In June of 1919, he came to visit me there along with former Dean Grayson Wagstaff, his wife Deborah, and former faculty member and head of music theater, Tom Peterson. What a wonderful time we had together. Over conversation, cocktails, Leo with his sodas only, and dinner. It was the last time I saw my dear colleague and friend. What decades we shared making music together. What talks and emails we shared with Leo, also the master of this spoken and written word. That young man coming from Los Angeles decades ago became such an important part of the life of the American church of the Shrine of the Basilica, of the Music School, and of, I my, of, of my life. I miss Leo as much today as I did in 2019, how much joy he brought to all of us through his music and friendship. Now, I've represented Elaine, and I would like to add a few sentences of my own. Um, rather than do paragraphs, I've decided to choose a word that would be the central thought of that paragraph and leave all of this to your imagination. Column A, observations if things aren't going well in rehearsal. Difficult Leo, problematic Leo, stubborn Leo, obstinate Leo, adamant Leo, 
Relentless Leo, resolute Leo. Now, in order to make things go better in rehearsal, he would unleash the following qualities. Dedicated Leo, devoted, faithful, steadfast, ardent, devout, fervent, joyous, relentless, pious, inspired, poetic, cultivated, imaginative, sensitive, expressive. He would say to me about his students, I need them to get better, to be better, to become artistic, to be a servant of the art, he once said to me. Always the search for the inner voices. Once he entered my office for a conference that I knew was coming and I dreaded. His jaw was tight, eyes one-fourth closed. He sat down, and I said to him, before he opened his mouth, I said, Leo, I want you to listen to something. And I brought out a recording of a tenor by the name of David Gruenfeld. This was the Ingemisco from the Verdi uh, Requiem, made in uh, 1952 or 53 in Amsterdam. Gruenfeld was a surviving prisoner of Terezin in Auschwitz, and was the tenor soloist for all 16 performances of the Verdi Requiem at Terezin. The voice was heaven sent. Phrasing, passion, restraint, then a vocal thrust into nature toward the horizon, breathtaking. It was the sort of singing that reminds all of us why we went into music. And as Leo would see it, what we needed to instill in our kids. When the Injamisco was finished, I said, okay, what did you want to chat about? He was wiping his eyes, and he stood and walked to the door and said, it'll keep. Yes, it would keep, especially after what we just heard. And for all those terms of desperation in my column A, especially obstinate and relentless, when I learned of his death, I wept. I did. I knew we would miss his, his demand that we repair the world. I came here tonight instead of going to synagogue, so you won't mind if I end with two Hebrew words which mean repair the world. Tikkun olam.